Good morning, everyone. You've tuned in to Pilgrim Congregational United Church of Christ here in Lansing, Michigan. This is September 13th of the year 2020. And we continue to record our worship services in the Pilgrim Sanctuary so our regular attenders can find familiarity and continuity as they view our worship. Our announcements are very much the same as they have been in previous weeks. Pilgrim's building remains closed to the general public through the month of September. Alcoholics Anonymous and Pilgrim's Small Children's Closed Closet uh, continue to operate with social distancing. Church office uh, has Janice Bowling at her desk on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays from 9.30 a.m. to 12 noon. We are continuing to provide food in the free food pantry and an exchange of books in our free library, which are on opposite sides of our church building. Uh, Pilgrim's executive ministry team will be meeting on Monday, September 14th, to discuss the business of the church. I want to thank uh, the people who participate in our mobile fellowship on Saturday mornings. A, a group of us get together and drive to the homes of members and friends of the congregation to say hello, serenade them with a song, and give them an edible treat. Uh, thanks goes especially to our moderator, Karen Davis, for organizing these events. Next Sunday, September 20th, we are planning on our annual Native American Sunday. And the Sunday after that, December, uh, September 27th, we will have another drive-in service in Pilgrim's parking lot, and we will be serving communion. Now, let us begin our worship with a prayer of invocation. Let us pray. We turn to you, O oh God, asking for you to be present with us in a special way. You have given us life. You have created us and you continue to sustain us. We depend upon you. We need your life-giving presence. You provide a bounty for us to share you give us guidance in how to live and to work together. But we humans have neglected your instruction. We have failed to appreciate the gifts that you've given us. We have held on to the bounty of this world for ourselves and shrunk away from sharing with our brothers and sisters. 
The times we are living in are confusing and overwhelming. We are divided over social issues, political differences, and approaches to religion. Teach us the good that benefits all. Lead us in sharing. Empower us for caring. Help us to live lives which promotes life. Be with us all, and let your spirit enliven us. Amen. Well, Randy Roy has a song for us about uh, what Jesus said. To us, whatever we do to others, we do to him. I think Randy can sing it better than I can explain it, so uh, please go ahead, Randy. When you do this to them, you do this to me. When you hold somebody's hand, help the blind to see. Take a moment of your day, help the lost soul find their way. Set a spirit free. Thank you, Randy. Uh, let us pray. Dear God, we live in confusing times which have challenged us greatly. As you know, we are in the midst of a pandemic and we are continuing to face restrictions and limits that we have not had to cope with before. It's been a long time since we have had to interrupt our daily routines. We have not heard of an ending 
to these unusual circumstances. We are also faced with the difficult issue of unfair treatment and injustice because of race. We are in the midst of a contentious political season of electing a president. Many candidates for political office are vying for our support and vote. People of our country seem to be polarized in their opinions and points of view. We seem to be so far apart that we cannot imagine coming together. We seek your guidance in trying to understand who we are and what we should do. Help us today to grow in understanding and in knowledge of your ways. God bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. The opening song reflects the words of the first scripture for today, Romans chapter 14. We confess that if we live or if we die, we belong to God. God is our creator and the one who sustains us in life. Our lives are therefore dedicated to serving God and bearing good fruit for the kingdom of God. Our opening song, we see vivimos when we are living. The Apostle Paul wrote in his letter to the Romans explaining his theology and the best practices for how people could get along with each other. In the first part of this passage, Paul addresses a division among Christ's followers about dietary and holiday faithfulness to Jesus. Paul states that the followers of Jesus may have different ideas about how to practice their faith, but the important part is in whatever they do is that they do it to honor Christ. So Paul writes for us not to judge one another, but to realize that we all belong to God and will be accountable to God. Paul's letter to the Romans 
chapter 14, verses 1 through 12. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on the servants of others? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honor of the Lord. Also those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God. While those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then, each of us will be accountable to God. We are living in confusing and challenging times. When people of faith seek answers to the confusion and challenges in their lives, they turn to prayer, to meditation conversation, and sometimes they may even try reading scripture to understand what is going on and what they should do. Too many times people just see that times are tough, they don't want to change, so they conclude that it's time for God to end the world and create something new. Well, I don't think it's that simple. I do not think that God is going to end the world just because our problems seem too overwhelming and we do not want to change our thinking or what we do. I think God is challenging us to change. God is challenging us to put God's concerns and what God wants first in our priorities. A large part of that challenge that God gives us is for us to get along with one another. This Psalm 133, the psalmist says, how very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. And then in Romans 12, it says, Live in harmony with one another. Do not be arrogant, but associate with the lowly. And if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. In Romans 14, let us then pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. There are many more passages expressing the same desire of God for us. God wants us to get along with each other and to work together for the good of all. Now some might object and say that the scriptures were only referring to members of the church to have unity and to work together. But God desires harmony in all of creation. God created the world to be a paradise in the first place before human beings disobeyed God. And then in the New Testament, we're told that Christ has broken down the dividing walls between people and there is no longer Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female. Problem is that God may want us all to get along and Christ may have broken down the dividing walls between people, but we people keep making walls between us and with our fears and with our hatreds and our racism. Human beings keep wanting to make us and them. In a real sense, we human beings keep disobeying God's plan for us to live in paradise, and we keep living in a fallen and sinful world. The only 
Racism in the Bible was the distinction between Jews and Gentiles, and that distinction ended with the arrival of Christ. All people have one creator. In Ephesians 4, 6, it says, One God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in all. It seems that God wants us all to stop looking down on each other and stop hurting each other and stop keeping things for ourselves and, and taking them away from other people. Racism, hate, and fear are not a part of God's plan for us human beings. God wants us to live in peace, harmony, and love so we can be mutually upbuilding toward each other. God made us to help each other, not hoard resources from each other. So let us love one another as God intended and commanded us to do. Amen. In today's gospel lesson, the disciple Peter asked about how many times we should forgive someone. Jesus tells us the parable of the wicked slave as part of his response to Peter. Jesus tells us that as we go about our daily lives, it is important to remember that God has forgiven us if we sincerely confess. We should show others the same kind of generosity that God has shown us. Hear Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 through 35. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, the Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children, and all his possessions, and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves, who owed him a hundred denarii, and seized him by the throat. He said, pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he could pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw that ha what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to the Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all the debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Let us pray. Dear God, we ask for you to let your spirit come upon us so that we may be inspired and receive insight into the reading of your word for today. Help us, Lord, to understand what it is you want us to know and what you want us to live out. This we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Politics of hope and despair. Well, we are deep in presidential politics with the election still scheduled for the beginning of November. And most of us have never seen such contention, hostility, and confusion in American politics. Republicans and Democrats, conservatives and liberals are polarized and at complete odds with each other, it just seems. We are struggling with social themes such as authority versus individuality, survival versus fulfillment. And many feel that the only solution is to destroy the opposing political party. Many people are worried about the continuation of our democracy. But in doing some research, I came 
to realize that the divide between the political parties is not our country's biggest threat. Now, this sermon is based on a sermon I heard some years ago by uh, the Reverend Rick Boyd, formerly of uh, First Christian Church here in Lansing, Michigan. And he based his sermon on information from the book American Backlash, The Untold Story of Social Change in the United States by Michael Adams. American Backlash is a statistical study of American values by Michael Adams, a Canadian researcher. The study describes how American values have changed over a 20-year period before and after the events of September 11th. The book was published in 2004, but it still has great relevance for us today. Now, Michael Adams had an army of interviewers calling 7,000 people from the United States each year for 20 years, asking them 600 questions each. So you can see that this was a very extensive study. The kind of answers people gave showed what kind of values and moral code they follow. They asked questions such as these. One, do you feel you should treat others as you would like to be treated? Two, what would happen if everyone acted like you do? Three, what sort of world is just and happy and how would individuals in that world behave? Four, what are your responsibilities to others and what effect does it have on your own well-being if you fail to live up to those responsibilities? Well, well these are some interesting questions which uh, I'm sure most church people would not mind answering too much. But listen to these next four questions. Five, do you agree or disagree that violence can sometimes be exciting? Six, do you agree or disagree that when a person cannot take it anymore and he or she feels that they are about to explode, a little violent behavior can relieve the tension and that it's no big deal? Seven, do you agree or disagree that violence is a part of life and it's no big deal. Eight, do you agree or disagree that it is acceptable to use physical force to get something you really want? The important thing is that you get what you want. Well, I think that we might have a bit more uh, trouble and be a bit more uncomfortable about those last four questions. If your life is fulfilling and you are reasonably comfortable, you probably don't feel the need to become violent. If you like the way things are, and you are not likely then to want things to change. But if you see life as a struggle to survive in a dog-eat-dog -dog world, then I guess you become accustomed to violence and brute force to get what you want. Now there are 592 more questions in the survey, which I don't have the time to recite here. But let me just say that when the results of the survey were tallied, the team noticed a pattern. There were differences between people who voted Republican and Democrat. But those differences were small compared to the differences between people who voted for either party and the people who did not vote at all. They determined that the differences between voters and non-voters depended upon people's values of authority versus individuality and whether people felt their lives were being fulfilled or they were just surviving, just getting by. Well, let me explain more. Uh, this study found that there is a group of Americans who generally believe that obeying authority will lead our nation to prosperity. They believe that obeying the law and recognized authorities will bring well-being to everyone. Religion and national strength will lead us to a happy and fulfilled life. These Americans emphasize values of a traditional family, national pride, 
duty, following organized religion, social order, and respect for the flag. And when they watched television, well, they would love a show about the American Revolution or World War II, and these people would identify themselves as Republicans, and they make up about 30% of the U.S. population. So they're not the majority. Well, there is another group of Americans who generally believe that it is individuality, not obedience to authority, that leads to personal happiness and fulfillment. They value the rights of individuals and free expression and liberty. They value free thinking, diversity, and cross-cultural experiences. And they'd watch shows on PBS, Sesame Street for the children and independent lens for the adults. They would top off their week with Saturday Night Live and maybe a foreign movie. This is another 30% of the population which they identify themselves as Democrat. Democrats are not the majority either. America is 30% Republicans and 30% Democrats. The majority group in America is the non-voters, making up 40% of the population. These people do not care about patriotism or religion or traditional family or personal duty and responsibility. They feel that authority is not out to help them, but rather it is to put them down. They feel prosperity and personal fulfillment are not an option for them. They do not believe that the American dream will ever happen for them. They are out to merely survive, and they will break the law if it gets in their way, and they feel that they can get away with it. Happiness is for those who take it, because it is a dog-eat-dog -dog world in which you are either a winner or a loser. Either you do what is necessary by any means necessary to get what you want, or you're going to get pushed aside. And if you are pushed aside, well, you deserve no consideration because you are weak. To them, life is brutal, and you are on your own. They see life as a lot like the Wild West. It is everyone for themselves. It's the law of the jungle. Might makes right. The strong have the right to oppress the weak, and the strong survive and the weak die. They do not have time for church, but they, make like, uh, they may like to overcome some of their loneliness by going to a concert or sporting event. And if they watch TV, well, they'll probably tune in to Survivor or Jerry Springer or some other reality show. Life for these people offers very little hope of ever being better. They see very little reason for getting along with others unless there is something in it for them. Other people are to be used. So where does the study show that we Americans are going? What is our direction that we're headed for? Well, to the disappointment of the Republicans, we are a society moving away from national pride and traditional values. To the disappointment of the Democrats, our society as a whole is moving away from cross-cultural exploration and global consciousness. The Canadian researchers see a trend in the United States over the last 20 years toward the survival modes of value. Namely, might makes right, men are superior to women, us versus them, or us versus everybody, being fatalistic about the environment, you know, there's nothing we can do about it, so why should I bother? And the acceptance of violence as a means of getting what you want. They like risky or extreme behavior because it feels exciting. If you have it, flaunt it. I don't care if you don't have it as long as I do. But basically, life is a brutal competition. It's exclusive. It's for thrills and conspicuous consumption. Growing number of people have the attitude that it's 
all about me. Remember that this group is bigger than those who vote Republican and Democrat separately. These non-voters like violence and risk. They follow their impulses. They feel there is no hope for the environment and society will never get better. They do not save money. They spend money to show off. They do not believe in the American dream. They do not care about God or patriotism, duty or justice for all. They are out for themselves, for number one. Other people are there to be used. I think you get it. It's a horrible thing to live without hope. But there, that is where our country is heading more and more. That is not to say that the largest group is a bunch of anarchists blockading their homes and stockpiling guns. Uh, there are some people like that, but the big concern is that there is a significant portion of the population who do not believe that things are ever gonna get better. And so there is no sense for them to debate, to cooperate, or compromise. Now, doesn't that kind of remind you of what's going on in Washington, D.C., in the state legislatures? Republicans and Democrats spend most of their time and efforts trying to undermine each other, but the other political party is not the real enemy. We keep hearing that the values of the Republicans and the Democrats are incompatible and cannot be resolved in a positive manner. But the truth is, that Democrats and Republicans have more in common with each other than with non-voters. Democratic and Republican voters both care about God, patriotism, the nation, the environment, marriages, saving money and cooperating. They both believe in community. Well, don't get me wrong. There are big differences between Democrats and Republicans about personal freedom and government authority, but they both believe in some kind of community and that some kind of shared prosperity is possible. People who vote believe that what they do does matter and that we have an obligation to other people on how we behave. Voters may not agree with the specifics of the American community but at least voters all value ethical behavior, social engagement, emotional connection, and cooperation with each other. So while Republicans and Democrats have been fighting each other, the real problem of American society is the rising number of people who have no hope and do not care. We church-going people have important work to do with those people who have no hope. They do not know God or care about society or country. They, they do not believe in community or self-fulfillment. They are without hope and have no meaning or purpose for their lives. And so most of them just follow their selfish appetites and instinctual drives. This is a greater threat to our nation and our society than the COVID-19 pandemic, or the 1918 flu, or the bubonic plague. A plague of despair and meaninglessness is infecting our society and has been growing for some time. God sent Jesus to earth so that we might all have hope. Not just a hope of life beyond this biological existence in this world, but a hope of living a fulfilling life even here on earth. We have a message of God's love which a lost and hurting world needs to hear, needs to see. We have hope to offer because we know the love of God and we know that God loves all people and we know that God wants all people to live in fellowship and in harmony. All of our lives are better when we care about one another. God knew this 
when God commanded us to love our neighbor as ourselves. So let us give hope. Let us go forth and bring hope to the world. Amen. Uh, sharing some of our blessings and concerns with one another. Um, let us keep in mind for our prayers today that throughout the week that there are fires raging in the western part of our country, there are floods in another part of our country. We're all still coping with the coronavirus pandemic. Our nation is facing tensions in social and political issues. And there are people who are sick and people who have lost someone dear to them. Let us pray for these and the other concerns that are upon our hearts. Let us pray. Oh God, we thank you for calling us to serve you. We thank you, God, that you have loved us and that you have given us hope. And dear God, we realize that there is a need for your message of hope in the world, a message of caring that the God who created all people cares and that we need to care for one another. You have given us many blessings and we dearly appreciate all the blessings you have given us. And God, you have come to us in many ways and we ask for your help in overcoming our differences and realizing that we have more in common than we have to be different. God, there are people who are suffering from the COVID virus. There are also people who are suffering from other diseases as well, and we pray for their healing. We pray, Lord, for those on our prayer list for our church. We lift them up for your care and consideration. We ask for comfort upon all of them. And God, yes, we remember the first responders and the medical care people. We ask for their protection and we ask once again for your blessings upon them. God, we are in a contentious country and we pray for our divisions to be healed. But God, we may find out that whom we thought was the enemy was not our real one. There is a hopelessness and despair that is coming upon not just our country, but the world. So God, we need to reach out and give people hope. So God, help us in this endeavor to bring that hope. May that hope live in our hearts so that we might give it to others. And Lord God, pray for those who are suffering from fires and those from flood and other natural disasters around the world. Dear God, we thank you for all that you have given us. Keep us all, dear God, in good health of spirit and body and mind. And so God, we come together as a community of faith a community that loves you and one another, and so we pray the words that Jesus gave us, and we combine our spirits in this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. We gather in worship to thank God for the many blessings we have received and to praise God for the wonder and awe of what God can do. God is the creator of all creation, and in the following hymn, all of creation gives God thanks and praise. To worship God and to serve God wholeheartedly is to be filled with joy. We now sing, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore You. Joy. 
that you belong to God because God loves you without condition. But still be aware because God will condemn our attitudes and behaviors that go against the law of love. All people have one creator, one Lord God. We're all brothers and sisters in this family of God. So God calls upon us not to condemn people from a prejudged judicial judgment, but God asks us to love, and love is the only acceptable prejudice. That is a prejudice God has toward each one of us, and is the prejudice that God wants us to hold. Let us be the instruments that urges others to overcome fear and hatred. Let us be the instruments of God's love who accept and respect others. Let us overcome evil with good. Let us bring hope to the world and let us overcome hate with love. God bless you all. Amen.